Thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me uh, to my city, which is always a pleasure when you're in the U.S. to uh, be able to uh, go back. Um, today, I've been invited to uh, give a talk and summarize uh, what we know about chromosome abnormalities, uh, mostly aneuploidism and mosaicism in human embryos. Uh, most of all of the data that I'm going to present is on uh, day five biopsies, which is 99% of, of the cases that we are uh, currently um, doing in the U.S. It's very, there is very little day three biopsies anymore in, in the U.S. There are different types of chromosomal abnormalities that we can detect uh, in embryos. Uh, some are inherited, such as translocations, deletions, and inversions. Uh, Others are meiotic in origin, such as uh, trisomies and monosomies. And some uh, that uh, we weren't testing uh, before, uh, which are post-meiotic abnormalities, are also quite common. Polyploidies, mosaicism, the number of deletions, and duplications. I will focus most of the talk on uh, meiotic errors and post-meiotic errors. As you know, uh, chromosomal abnormalities and amplitude increases with advanced maternal age uh, from 30% to 80% depending on maternal age. And this is basically the sole cause of the loss of implantation potential uh, with advanced maternal age. Uh, as you know, uh, in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, people have been delaying reproduction uh, in order to pursue career and education, uh, and this is a phenomenon that is it's, uh, happening all over the uh, all over the world. Um, this this trend is even more um, accentuated in some countries, for instance, China. And this basically this delay in reproduction uh, equates into infertility by an um, The the more uh, you delay um, having children. Uh, the higher the chance that you would produce abnormal embryos and the typical decrease in implantation potential that, that we see. Uh, these are a summary of uh, thousands of embryos that we have analyzed, more than 60,000 embryos by Array CGH. Uh, as you could see, um, there is a significant decrease in number of abnormal, uh, sorry, number of normal embryos. Uh, with the management maternal age from 65% to 13%. Uh, What's interesting is that there is no difference in um, chromosome abnormalities depending on the cohort size. So it doesn't matter how many embryos are produced, uh, you get the same rate of chromosome abnormalities in, in every age group. Uh, this is obviously important uh, for patients when you cancel them. Um, same thing, we found exactly the same thing with uh, Nature and sequencing. Uh, there is uh, there are a few uh, less euploid embryos because now some of them we are classifying them as, as mosaic. Uh, so that's that's why you see if you compare it back to uh, a race PGH, uh, there is a, a, a small decrease in the number of euploid embryos. Uh, those are now classified as, as mosaic. Um, again, uh, we don't see a relationship between number of embryos and chromosome normalities. And as I said, this is important to consult patients because you want to uh, tell them what's the chance of uh, at least finding one normal embryo. And obviously, uh, then this becomes important, how many embryos you are producing, because the more embryos you produce, the higher the chance that you will find a normal embryo. Obviously, at a certain age, let's say uh, 38 uh, or, or more, um, it's going to be very difficult to find um, normal embryos. Uh, if you have, uh, if you produce very few embryos. So um, some centers in the U.S., for instance, are doing embryo banking. So you do several cycles of IBF and then just one PGD. Uh, and then uh, you would have at least, uh, you could counsel them uh, that you could get to uh, finding this normal embryo. Uh, we didn't see uh, either a difference between monosomies and trisomies uh, when we do uh, either race CGH or nation sequencing, which is uh, what you should find uh, since they, they have the same chance of being produced by, by a meiotic error. And when you do uh, PGS, uh, as you know, there have been now several uh, studies, uh, clinical randomized trials. Uh, the three that have been uh, published uh, all show significant improvement in ongoing pregnancy rates. Uh, these have been done by uh, RACGH or by quantitative PCI by, by the group of Richard Scott. 
There are also two meta-analyses uh, showing that uh, the same, that there is an improvement in ongoing pregnancy rates when you do PGS. Uh, I've seen even in, in groups uh, such as egg donors, we've seen a, an improvement in ongoing pregnancy rates uh, in this group, which they have the lowest uh, chance of producing abnormal embryos. So even in this group, it seems to be uh, beneficial. And then if you compare day five embryos to day six embryos, it seems that uh, day five embryos uh, have more uh, euploidy than, than day six embryos. But once you transfer them, uh, if they are normal, they implant equally well. Obviously, you have to uh, transfer them on a delayed, sorry, on a frozen cycle. Uh, otherwise, these embryos do much, much worse because they, they have a high chance of, of losing the window of implantation. Uh, what we see now is that if you transfer a U-point embryo, they implant equally well at any age, at least up to 42 uh, years of, of age. Uh, this is data from uh, Reprogenetics that we published in 2013. And now, um, uh, David McCullough will present later uh, this data also. So he has analyzed data from SAR 2014, thousands of, of cases, and he finds exactly the same. This is data now from all the centers in the U.S showing that uh, if you transfer a euploid embryo, they implant equally well at any age. Um, also, we don't see an, an increase in spontaneous abortions uh, when we do PGS. In, instead, if you don't do PGS, you see the typical increase in um, miscarriages. Um, again, uh, they are from David, uh, David McCallow, showing exactly the same for, for Sir. And the same with uh, live birth uh, per transfer. Uh, interestingly, if you do PGD, uh, on average, you are only transferring one embryo. Uh, this is another study uh, that we um, just finished. Uh, it's going to be presented at ISRM. Uh, and I think it's been selected for the third prize. Basically, it's comparing um, first transfer uh, with frozen transfer and after PGS. And we don't see uh, for embryos that reach blastocysts at day five, uh, basically they have uh, the same chance of, of implanting, uh, both fresh or transfer. However, for the day six embryos, uh, they do much worse. So if you put together the whole cohort of embryos, it's better to do frozen transfer. Um, but um, if, if you have, let's say, enough uh, day five embryos on, on day five, um, it seems that this uh, day five they do equally well, um, either if they are fresh or, or frozen. And, and this, uh, this coincides with, with data from um, Shapiro. Uh, they also found that, that the embryos that reach blastocysts on day six are the ones uh, that are going to uh, suffer the most if you transfer them on, on a fresh cycle. Um, also, I wanted to comment on this paper. This paper has been uh, published recently. Um, basically, uh, they uh, analyze uh, recurrent pregnancy loss patients um, on the concept of uh, intention to treat, which is uh, it's going this concept is going to be debated uh, later. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, um, comment on that, but I'm going to comment on, on the paper since uh, basically they, they had uh, two groups: IVF plus PGS uh, or a control group. Um, if they mix the two groups, the two PGS groups, uh, because there were some patients that didn't have embryos transfer, um, and basically they canceled the cycle, uh, and then uh, patients that have uh, PGS and wasn't canceled. First, I would like to say that the maternal ages on the PGS is two years more, uh, so you have um, definitely a difference in the number of uh, chromosomal normalities that you would find in these two groups. So this, this is not a very good um, study in just by this fact. Uh, these are two different groups of patients. Um, then, uh, if you look at the IVF plus PGS compared to the control group, uh, there's a significant decrease in miscarriages, so it, it does work, PGS. Um, and also, you have a, a higher uh, rate of um, pregnancy per transfer. Um, However, if you put them together with an OPGS group, then, then uh, the two groups with the control are, are similar. The, the question is why the IVF with an OPGS group in this case had a double rate of uh, miscarriage than the control group. Uh, so there is something wrong with this uh, group B. 
Um, so, all in all, this study has a lot of uh, questionable um, factors that I think this needs to be uh, randomized in, in a better study. The problem is that it's very, very difficult uh, to do this study. Um, patients, uh, I don't think they would like to be uh, randomized, and also it's very difficult to, to do it um, for this group of patients. Um, there is another study, a randomized trial, that it's, uh, has uh, finished uh, recruitment. Uh, basically, uh, this third trial involves uh, nine PCD uh, labs, 34 clinical uh, sites uh, in four countries, uh, US, Australia, Canada, and UK. And it involves patients uh, 25 to 40 years of age with two or more blastocysts. Uh, if you compare this to the other trials that have been done, um, those are usually on, they, they were done on groups of patients that were of good prognosis. So these are average prognosis. This will be, I think, the first uh, and, and a very large uh, study uh, involving the average uh, patient that you would find in, in your clinic. And it consists of 300 controls and 300 tests. All of them have been already randomized. Um, we are just collecting data now, uh, pregnancy data. Uh, we think that by December uh, we'll have all the data and then we'll start analyzing it in December and we think that we'll be able to, to present it at, at ASHRAE. Now I'll talk a little bit about mosaicism and this has been uh, well, uh, very well discussed, if I may say, uh, by Josh uh, this morning. Uh, and basically, we, as representatives, we find uh, more or less exactly the same thing that they found. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, mosaics are uh, nothing that has been invented by, uh, by uh, nature and sequencing. We, we know about mosaics uh, since uh, the early 90s. Uh, thousands of embryos were analyzed by fish, uh, each cell at a time. Uh, so this is a, a well-documented phenomenon that occurs in, in embryos, and it's very common, uh, especially on day three, where about 30% of embryos were mosaic, and also on blastocyst. Um, the problem was that uh, after we moved from fish to a race GH, you would not, uh, you weren't able to, to distinguish these mosaics very well. About only 4% of embryos would be classified as mosaic with that technique. Uh, and it's not until uh, we've, done, uh, we've moved to an ancient sequencing that you are able now uh, to detect them uh, well as, as we were before. So depending on the technique that you use, uh, you will classify differently about 20% of embryos. Uh, this is an example of uh, an array CGH uh, profile and an ancient sequencing profile. Uh, as you can see, because of, of the dynamic range of, of nature sequencing, uh, here you can distinguish better that this embryo is, is a mosaic, uh, comparing it to a race CGH in which you would have classified this embryo probably as, as a monosomy. Uh, this is also an example of, of a mosaic embryo in which it doesn't reach completely the limit of, of full trisomy. And this is uh, the uh, example, um, the experiment doing dilutions of, of cells, trisomy to, um, to monosomy, sorry, trisomy to uh, normal or monosomy to normal cells uh, that Josh also has uh, repeated uh, very elegantly uh, and he has shown us uh, this morning. Uh, with, uh, with nature sequencing and, and classifying this as high-resolution agent sequencing to this uh, differentiate it from um, the other technique that is being used by, by one of the centers in, in the U.S. in which they basically just sequence uh, ALU sequences um, and it's very low resolution. Uh, with this, we find about that 21% of embryos are mosaic with some cells normal and some cells abnormal. But after this, uh, about uh, another 10% that have um, a full abnormality, and then it's also mosaic. If you put the two together, you get about 30% mosaic, which is what we were finding when we were doing fish. So we find exactly the same rate of mosaicism than, than before. Uh, it seems here that uh, mosaics decrease with advancement of knowledge, but this is not uh, true. If you put the two together, uh, basically it's uh, about 30% at any age. Uh, what happens is that uh, because an output is increasing, you, you get uh, progressively more embryos classified as abnormal plus mosaic. 
Uh, this is another way of looking at this. Uh, so as you could see, uh, mosaics don't increase with maternal age, only an employee increases and UPOID decreases. So what's the outcome of these mosaics when we transfer them? Um, we started to, uh, um, to compare um, RACGH and agent sequencing as, and after we had um, uh, discrepancy. Uh, we transferred an embryo that was by RACGH normal, and then the PSC showed that it was a trisomy 16. Uh, so we reanalyzed the same sample um, that we have, the DNA stored. We stored all the DNAs from the 50,000 embryos that we do every year. And uh, what we found out is that, uh, in fact, this embryo was by a RACGH, sorry, by an agent sequencing, it was a mosaic embryo. Then we uh, reanalyzed all the discrepancies that we had by uh, a RACGH, about 52 out of, I think, 25,000 cycles. And what we found is that half of them, 50% uh, of them, uh, were in fact mosaics by a RACGH. So definitely these, these embryos are contributing to the miscarriage rate that you see in, in a RACGH. So if uh, you don't do PGS, uh, you will have between 17 and 40% miscarriage rate depending on maternal age. Uh, with the race each age, it's about 17%, and with uh, high resolution agent sequencing, it's about 6%. So, as you could see, uh, you can cut in half uh, the rate of uh, miscarriages uh, if you move from a race each age to an agent sequencing. Uh, this is data from NYU. Uh, they, they've done quite a bit of cases with us using both techniques, uh, an agent sequencing and a race each age. And as you could see, again, there is the trend towards uh, lower miscarriage rate uh, with uh, nation sequencing. And they already see an improvement in ongoing pregnancy rates comparing the, the two groups. Uh, also, this was uh, presented by Fraguli uh, recently at PGDIS. Um, although they miscarry more and they implant less, uh, some of them do uh, implant and, and reach term. Uh, but much fewer than, than you pretty. And some, as, as uh, Francesca Fiorentino has, has published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, some of them make babies. Uh, the thing uh, is that, okay, we have this uh, intermediate group of embryos uh, that it seems that they could make babies. The question, the next question obviously is, um, are these babies going to be uh, normal or not? Uh, in the, if you do prenatal diagnosis, as you know, about 1% of uh, patients uh, or prenatal diagnosis from in vivo conceptions uh, would be mosaic, a prenatal diagnosis. So to say, are these embryos going to be still mosaic after uh, we transfer them? I would say at least we need 200 data points. And right now, uh, from different meetings that we've been uh, going and, and asking Fiorentino, Fraguli, etc., I think there are only 30 babies uh, born so far. So we, we, we cannot tell you right now if these uh, babies are going to be uh, normal or not. Uh, so far, all of them have been euploid, either at prenatal diagnosis or at birth. So it's uh, encouraging, but we need more data. Um, which mosaic embryos are safer to transfer, if you want to transfer them? Uh, before, we, we've seen the, this data from Genesis Genetics, in which they show that if the, the rate of uh, abnormal cells in, in the blastocyst biopsy is low, uh, it's less than 40%, then they implant uh, quite well, almost the same as um, euploid embryos. They miscarry a little bit more. Um, but at the end, I mean, it seems that these embryos are quite safe uh, for transfer. Uh, obviously, what we are missing is once you transfer them, uh, are they going to be um, normal phenotypically? And that, that we won't know, as I said, until we transfer at least 200, and we have at least 200 pregnancies. Uh, same thing has been found by, by Fiorentino. Uh, Embryos with a low percentage of abnormal cells uh, do better than, than embryos with high percentage of abnormal cells. Uh, however, I think that there is even a better classification than using only percentage of mosaics, and it's what type of mosaicism do you have? 
So, for instance, if the, the mosaic is uh, complex and normal, so you have uh, two or more embry sorry, two or more chromosomes that are involved in mosaic form, they very seldom uh, implant. Uh, only five percent of them are ongoing. Uh, mosaics that have uh, a full uh, aneuploidy, um, let's say some cells are normal, some cells are trisomy 20, uh, about 30% of them will be ongoing. Uh, and mosaics that have a, a partial uh, monosomy or a partial trisomy seem to be the one that do best. Uh, about 60% of them will be ongoing, very similar to what you would expect from a euploid embryo. So this seems to be uh, an even better way of classifying embryos than just going by the percentage of abnormalities. As you could see, if you go by percentage of abnormalities, you will get 28% ongoing uh, or 38% ongoing. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the other classification gives you a better uh, discrimination of which embryos uh, would do better. Uh, we've done a study in which uh, we dissected 71 uh, blastocysts and we took between two and five uh, different biopsies uh, per embryo, uh, including the inner cell mass. And the data that I will present is per tissue and also per chromosome. So let's say uh, one biopsy had two types of mosaicism and five uh, tissues, that would be 10 data points. Uh, what we found is that uh, if the embryo was fully abnormal, um, then uh, the rest of tissues are also uh, fully abnormal. None, none of the inner cell mass was, were normal. Uh, but if you have mosaics, um, we found that 11% of complex mosaics uh, were, uh, had a normal inner cell mass and 41 to 44% of the other mosaics. Um, again, this explains why uh, complex mosaics, uh, they do the worst. Uh, very few of them have a, a normal inner cell mass. But 40% of mosaics have a normal inner cell mass. Um, this is another way of uh, presenting the data. Uh, so uh, these were mosaics to start with, uh, but then uh, depending on, on uh, the, what the, the tofactolin biopsy was, and I said there could be three or four uh, tofactolin biopsies, uh, the inner cell mass was usually euploid, if the tofactolin was euploid, uh, or it was mostly aneuploid if it was aneuploid, but if it was mosaic, uh, then you could see these, these differences, and, and obviously uh, it seems again that um, embryos with low percentage of normal cells have a higher chance of having a, a normal inner cell mass. So, 40% uh, of inner cell masses are normal. That's more or less the same chance that you have that uh, an undiagnosed embryo will be normal. So, basically, you could say, if, like some people, uh, they don't like the concept of mosaics, that a mosaic embryo is the same as an undiagnosed embryo. They have the same chance of being normal. Um, therefore, uh, as an undiagnosed embryo, you should consider them for replacement after you exhausted uh, the, the euploid embryos. So, for, for all these uh, reasons, uh, we propose uh, in, in this paper with Jamie Grifo and Dagan Wells that uh, we should change uh, the, the, how we look at, at these mosaics. Um, before, uh, we will classify embryos as normal or abnormal and give you an error rate between 2 and 10 percent depending on, on the technique that we were using and you will get uh, false positives and false negatives. Uh, now, uh, if we classify them into normal, mosaic and abnormal, uh, if you transfer normal ones, you have very low error rate um, and then you have this group, this gray group of, of mosaics that uh, depending on on the patient and on the circumstances of, of that cycle, you may want to transfer or not. Uh, again, this is another way of, of uh, exemplarizing the same thing. Before, with the GH, we had either normal embryos or abnormal embryos, and now we have this gray area uh, of mosaics. Uh, the normal ones are now going to implant better and miscarry less. Uh, the abnormal ones have much less potential of uh, being misdiagnosed uh, if, if they were euploid. 
Uh, and then you have this uh, middle group um, in which we are rescuing some embryos that we would have classified before as abnormal. Now they have still some potential of being uh, of implanting. Uh, meanwhile, some of the normal ones uh, now uh, have lower potential uh, because they, they will miscarry more and implant less. So depending on the need of that patient, um, this, uh, I think, actually helps you uh, give them a, a better um, result because, let's say, for instance, if it's a recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, you would not like to transfer embryos that have uh, a high chance of miscarrying. Meanwhile, if it's a patient that has just one embryo, uh, it's, a, it's the last cycle that they want to do, uh, and you still have some potential in, in some of these embryos that before would have been classified as abnormal uh, to implant. Um, we are all groups debating how to classify these embryos and, and how to report them. And uh, right now, at least at Representatives, uh, the current option is we report from 20 to 80 percent of them. Uh, but we are debating uh, to change it. Uh, some groups or, or some clinics are, are asking us to report less, fewer mosaics. Uh, so uh, you have all these options. Um, obviously, the, the more um, sorry, the fewer mosaics you, you transfer, the closer you are at the situation of a race EGH. I think that a better way of reporting the, them is us to report what's the potential of these embryos to implant. So, um, and, and this, this, is, uh, this is the first time I, I show this slide, and it's just a hypothesis, and I, I would like to, to know your, your uh, opinion if this would be something that you would like to counsel your patients on. I think if we give you the, the potential of implantation of these embryos and the potential of miscarrying, um, then, for instance, uh, you could counsel different patients in different ways. For instance, uh, if we have a, a euploid mosaic with 40 to 80 percent abnormal cells, if it's a recurrent pregnancy loss, you don't want to transfer this embryo, right? But if it's a patient that just have uh, very few embryos, this is the only one available, they don't want to do any more IVF cycles, you may want to transfer this embryo because it still has some potential to implant. Uh, so, depending on the patient, um, you would uh, counsel them differently. Uh, if the lab uh, tells you no, from 40% up it's, uh, it's uh, abnormal and from 40% down it's normal, you, you cannot do this um, and you would be doing a disservice to the patient. So I think it's important to, to give them the maximum information, but in, the, in a context that they can understand it like this. So in summary, for mosaic embryos, uh, natient sequencing is the best uh, method to, to detect most of them. About 21% will be classified as mosaic. Uh, these, these mosaic embryos miscarry more uh, than euprot embryos, but if you deselect them, uh, then you will have about 6% uh, or so uh, miscarriage rate only. Uh, they implant less than euprot embryos, especially uh, complex abnormals. Uh, but still 40% of the inner cell masses of these embryos are normal and therefore uh, they, they have uh, some potential uh, of making normal babies uh, and therefore uh, we should, we recommend to uh, consider them a third group, an intermediate group, um, same potential as an undiagnosed group. Um, and if you transfer them, uh, then we recommend to do amnio, otherwise uh, if you do CBS, you would do basically testing the, the same tissue again. Uh, to finalize, I would like to um, report on, on data that we have in which we compare different IVF centers. And as uh, I'm going to show you, there are significant differences depending on the IVF center on the rate of chromosome abnormalities uh, produced. So, um, in order to compare different centers, uh, what we thought is that the best group is egg donors. Uh, egg donors are usually selected in the same way uh, all over uh, in the U.S. at least because there are some rules on how you uh, how you select these em these patients. They are all young. They are all fertile. Uh, and this basically eliminates a bunch of uh, confounding factors that, that you will have if you compare, for instance, um, IVF patients of uh, 35 and, and younger, because then some, some patients have worse prognosis in the past, everything was abnormal, and then they moved to egg donation. 
uh, but they, they want to know what's, what's being transferred and, and that's why uh, they choose this. Um, there were um, 42 centers that at least we had uh, 10 cycles of egg donation or more. Average egg donation, uh, sorry, average uh, age of the, the donors was 25 and the average uh, unemployment rate was 31%. But what we saw is that uh, the range of unemployment between the centers was from 18 to 60 percent. Huge difference. Uh, this is another way of, of looking at this. Uh, so some centers had a very low rate of UPOID and some very high from uh, 40 percent to 80 percent. Uh, and then uh, recently we uh, submitted also this, I think to ISRM, um, in which we also analyzed the rate of mosaicism, and the same thing we found uh, that some uh, centers produce more mosaics than others, um, as the same way of uh, they, they produce more on equity than others. Uh, interestingly, it's uh, the two things that move in the same direction. So, for instance, uh, Center 9 had only 18% on equity, but the highest rate of mosaicism, uh, meanwhile, others um, had the contrary. Um, as to what we did, some, some of these centers have produced lots of um, PGS cycles and uh, we asked them if each doctor per center uh, they stimulate uh, on the same way. For instance, um, NYU, uh, which we collaborate quite a bit, uh, there is just one doctor that does all the stimulations for, for that center. Therefore, um, we excluded these centers uh, for the comparison, but there, we, we found a couple of centers uh, in which each doctor stimulated differently, and we found differences in chromosomal normalities between doctors of the same IVF center. So the lab, the IVF lab is the same, uh, but the doctors are doing something different uh, on these uh, patients, which are producing different rates of chromosomal normalities. Um, we can only speculate why is that. Um, obviously, uh, you would think about uh, hormone stimulation, uh, but also it could be uh, which follicles each doctor are retrieving. Uh, for instance, we know that the small follicles uh, have uh, higher chances of being multinucleated and therefore producing more chromosomal abnormalities. Um, it could be things that. Um, I don't know, maybe the, the suction uh, in the aspiration, who knows? Uh, we, we don't have a working hypothesis for that. Um, and it's not obviously all the result of, of the doctor. As I said, there are uh, differences also uh, in the center that we know. Uh, there are some factors such as temperature, pH, uh, media that could produce differences in chromosome abnormalities. For instance, uh, this will be presented also at uh, ISRM. Is a page, uh, this is a paper comparing uh, two different media, uh, and just by uh, using different media, uh, they were they showed that uh, there was a significant difference in chromosomal normalities uh, between the two media. Although I would I would uh, argue uh, that the pH values on on the two media are different, so. We don't know if it's the media or the, the pH, but just by, by uh, something as simple as, as pH or the media, uh, you could change the rate of chromosomal normalities that you have. Uh, I would argue, therefore, that, that PGS is the best or one of the, the best um, quality control uh, measurements that you could have when you want to change something in, in your lab. In summary, uh, 30 to 90 percent of embryos are unemployed, depending on maternal age, and these embryos uh, miscarry more, um, they, or they, they do not implant, and this is the major reason, or actually the only reason for the decrease in, in implantation potential with advanced maternal age. If we transfer a euploid embryo, uh, then they implant equally well at any age, at least up to the age of 42. Um, there are at least three randomized trials uh, with good pregnancy patients showing that uh, there is an improvement in ongoing pregnancy rates and hopefully this, uh, this trial uh, start will, will show the same uh, in regular patients. Um, and finally, an agent sequencing now. Uh, it's, it's a technique that uh, it's allowing now to uh, screen for, for mosaics and this gives us a better um, better screen potential. Uh, we now have an intermediate group 
with intermediate potential. And uh, by, by doing that, I think we'll be able to maximize um, uh, transferring u polytembers if, if that's what we want, uh, or minimize uh, discarding uh, embers with some potential of implanting. Uh, and if the absence of, of Euclid embers, as I said, uh, you could consider transferring these mosaics, and, and if you do that, uh, we recommend uh, Amnius. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.